when Deanie was missing, I would pray real hard and ask God, help us find Deanie. Show us where he is. I'm not a psychic. I'm not crazy. But God kind of showed me a picture in my mind of a river of muddy water with weeds sticking up in it. I was scared to death. I've made my way out here to Shelby County. It is a very rural community out here in Kentucky. And you've got these little teeny tiny jewel box towns and it's just beautiful. And there's life on the water. There's rivers, there's lakes, you know, fishing and being outdoors. It's like a really nice, quiet life. And that's why it's really shocking when, obviously, when something terrible happens. lived here for many years. All in all, it's just a nice, peaceful town and good people. Rural communities, the individuals take care of each other. They truly watch out for each other. They um, are supportive in law enforcement. I don't worry about somebody breaking in on me or anything. I'm just a country girl. You gotta be free. Open up doors, open up your windows, let it all hang out. Back in 1998, a 40-year-old man named Kyle Dean Breeden, uh, who went by Deany, he was a really loved member of the community. And so when he went missing, there was a lot of heartache in the town here. And when his body showed up, everyone was devastated. Everybody in town was pointing the finger at everybody else. And so they could never nail down a suspect. It became a cold case. And it was really important to this community that they find out who did it and they get justice for Deany. And I don't know that he, the killer for Deany will ever be held accountable. I'm going to meet with Susan King, who lives here in rural Kentucky. She, probably more than anybody, can give us insight as to what went wrong in this case. Cold, wet paw. No, you're fine. It's hot out here. No, this it's is hot out here. gorgeous. Here, you got a hair up place. Because I'm a hair. You're a hairdresser. I'm a retired hairdresser. You're gonna fix me. You're in charge of making me look cute today. <laughs> How did you know Deanie Breeden? I went to high school with Deanie. Oh, okay. And he was so cute, and he was so funny, and so handsome, and. He was just hilarious, his personality. Yeah. Oh, him and his buddies, they were bad. Yeah. <laughs> Fun ones are sometimes. <laughs> After school, I went my way, and he was doing plumbing with his father's business. OK. And then it was in 1996, I think, that he came over with a cousin. And I hadn't seen him in a years and years and years. Mm -hmm. So we ended up going out that night. Next thing you know, we were together. Yeah. Were you guys on or off when Deanie went missing? We were off. I broke up with Deanie about three months before he went missing. The last day that anyone saw Kyle Dean Breeden was on October 26th of 1998, and he didn't show up for work the next day. I don't think anyone actually suspected any sort of foul play or that anything had happened to him. I think people had thought that he must have just been out partying or just out having fun, and that he's going to turn up sooner or later. He goes missing. How do you find out about it? His mom called me and wanted to know if Danny was at my house. And I said, no, I haven't seen him in about three weeks. The more time that passed, I think the more concerned people got some of his friends and a bunch of my friends. We would get together early every morning and we'd try to find him. We looked everywhere. My whole church was praying for Danny. And I can pray 
And sometimes God answers you, you know. Yeah, I know. I uh, told him, I said, Lord, we need help finding him. Show me where he's at. And what he showed me was a, a river. The water was muddy, and it was rushing by with a lot of weeds sticking up at the bank. On November 5th of 1998, two fishermen were fishing in the Kentucky River, and they found a body floating in the river near the reeds. And it ends up being Kyle Dean Breeden. We all came across the news about a body they found in the river, and the phone rang, and it was his oldest brother. It was just a terrible thing. The way his mom and dad suffered, it was devastating to everybody. It's a lot to shoulder when it's people that you've known your whole life. This was the absolute worst case scenario for a small town in Kentucky. The Kentucky State Police took lead of the investigation as soon as they found the body. My name is Todd Harwood. I spent 21 years with the Kentucky State Police. When Kyle Breeden's body was floating in the Kentucky River, the body presented evidence of bloating, which means that the body had been there for some time, and there was a guitar amplifier cord wrapped around his legs. Two gunshot wounds were found to the head. It was very apparent that this was a victim of some type of foul play, and once detectives picked up the Breeden investigation, their next task is to canvas the community. Initially, they only had a body. They didn't have any sort of eyewitness. So the state police start interviewing all of his friends and family to see when he was last seen, if they can put together a timeline. We know that at 10 a.m., he was at a bank obtaining a $250 loan. Between 2 and 3 p.m., he retrieved a fishing pole from a pawn shop. Who was the last person that had seen Deanie? Probably his killer was the last person he saw. I thought it was his drug dealer. One of them. He had many. I definitely thought it had something to do with drugs. Was the drug scene big here? Yes. Over in Shelbyville. It's terrible. Really? Awful. What are the drugs of choice? Danny used crack cocaine. That's what got him. Danny was a great guy. He really was. Right before your very eyes, he went from the funny, sweet, smiling Deany, and you could see his face change. He looked like a completely different person. Yeah. I tried my best to make Deany quit that stuff. I gave him the choice, me or the drugs. I thought I was so pretty and so sweet and so nice that he would choose me. Yeah. And he didn't. He would often go into different towns and purchase drugs. He would often borrow money to do so. He would ask for money because he had people hounding him to pay him back. Nobody really knew these people's names. That he would ever come to a bad end. Did that ever cross your mind? Yes, it did. Danny lived a dangerous life when he was using. I knew he was dealing with some people that were bad news, probably. Something that the police were able to determine is that Kyle seemed a little bit scared leading up to his death. He would ask people to pray for him. I was afraid for his life the whole time I was with him because those people don't fool around. And everybody was afraid that something was going to happen. This main street is beautiful. Here, straight from Kentucky, a hometown show. Oh, look, a meet and greet with the Shelbyville Police Department. They have food, family-friendly activities. It's dare. Alive and well in Shelbyville. Small towns have been dealing with the drug epidemic for decades, especially in the 90s when Danny Breeden died. And so people in this community wondered, was he murdered by a local drug dealer, or was it somebody else entirely? How do you go to church? How do you go to the supermarket not knowing who your friend's killer is? He was purchasing crack on a daily basis. Any drug dealer in that rural community was immediately suspected as being part of his death, being some type of a drug transaction gone bad. That sent a whole list of suspects. We knew that he had an inner circle, individuals that he was close to, his family, friends, that was a list of suspects. 
The original investigators on the case beat the streets. They interviewed a ton of individuals. But the problem is they were running in circles. Because Cal Breeden was well known in the Shelbyville community, rumor and innuendo can affect all facets of an investigation, such as this, when individuals know about each other, care about each other, they may not be as forthcoming with information. Oh, everybody was suspicious of everybody. Danny's parents wanted to know what happened to their son. It was heartbreaking. Small town rumor mill and word on the street really complicated this investigation. It seems like for every member of Shelbyville, there was a theory on who could have committed this crime. So I am off to meet Lauren Nichols, who is an attorney in Louisville, and she had gotten very heavily involved in this case. And I think she has a really good grasp of who all the players are. How long after the murder does it sit there? For seven years, it goes unsolved. What happens that kind of changes everything? In May of 2006, the Kentucky State Police assigned the case to Detective Harwood, and he ran with it. I did not get involved in the Breed investigation until May of 2006. My sergeant at the time asked me if I would look at several particular cold cases and see if I could make headway with them. The breeding investigation was one of those. I work sometimes 16, 18 hour days beating the streets of Shelbyville, Kentucky. The first place I like to go to is barbershops, bars, and preachers. Anybody that I could talk to, many individuals had reported that drug dealers were somehow involved in Deanie Breeden's disappearance. But when you talk to these individuals, every single one of them said the same thing, that any time he would get in debt or have financial issues, his mother would bail him out. Why do we want to take out the person when we know we're always going to get paid? So I had to look at the other individuals in this case. So Detective Harwood goes through the suspect list and pretty early on, he narrows in on Susan King, the on and off again girlfriend. Susan King was always a suspect. The original investigator actually went to her residence and was able to obtain a brief, limited interview with her. This is probably in 1999 and observed bullet holes on the floor of Susan King's residence at the time period. Investigators approached the Commonwealth attorney for a search warrant. He indicated there was not enough evidence at that time to move forward with a search warrant. Detective Harwood thinks that it's very suspicious that the police officer saw before that there were two bullet holes in her floor. And that was in the previous officer's notes. Yes. Working in rural communities, especially cold cases, a lot of times you know who did it. You know how they did it. But proving is another story. Susan and Deanie had a history of domestic violence. They would kind of beat up on each other. Was she the aggressor in those situations? She says no. She says that she would do whatever it took to defend herself, but that she was not typically the aggressor. Well, my relationship with Deanie was good one day and bad the next, because when he wasn't on drugs, he was a great person to be around. But then when Deanie get on the drugs, then yeah, he'd come home and and he'd hit me and stuff. Don't like fighting, but I don't like to be mistreated. When I looked into Susan King as a suspect, I found at least three individuals that she had put a gun to their head, threatening to kill them on separate incidents. And one of those identified a 22 caliber weapon, the same type that Kyle Deany Breeden was killed with. The case was reopened on May 22nd. Uh -huh. And by June 12th, he already has a search warrant. <laughs> we pulled back the carpet. The first thing we see is four bullet holes. They lift the floor out. We immediately find that there's a 22 caliber round lodged in one of the bullet holes in that piece that we lifted out. What I think happened is Cal Dini Breed 
gets to Susan King's residence, a domestic argument ensues, and I think Susan King finally made good on those threats and shot Caldini Breeden right there in her residence. Detective Harwood, after his investigation concluded, he put together a list of why he thought Susan King was the murderer. So oh, yeah, here's his indictment request. Oh, this is it. He calls it the big break, where they observed bullet holes in her floor. In one of the holes, there was male human DNA. And then Susan was an avid guitar player. By the time that Detective Harwood is doing this investigation, she owned an electric guitar. The victim was found with a guitar amplifier cord wrapped around his legs. In a subsequent search warrant, we found inside her residence guitar amplifier cords. Did they ever find any DNA on the amplifier cord that would have tied her to it? No. You can have a lot of circumstantial evidences. You don't have to have a smoking gun. Okay. And so the fact that she was a fisherman and had experience fishing in and around the Kentucky River in the Gratz area, he was found at a place that she had previously fished before, was significant to him. It was April of 2007. This case was finally presented before the Spencer County Grand Jury. I'm Thomas Clay, I'm an attorney and I do criminal defense work as well as plaintiff's civil work. Nine years after the homicide, the grand jury returns an indictment for murder. Well, the problem with that is that there was exculpatory evidence which tends to prove that Susan King was innocent, which was withheld, such as Susan King was involved in an automobile accident that resulted in the loss of her leg and not just a little bit of it. Her wound required them to amputate her leg up into her hip. Susan was confined to crutches. None of that was presented to the grand jury. That wasn't part of their consideration in indicting her. The allegations against her were that this 98-pound woman who is disabled somehow or another murdered a 200-pound man and then take his body, drag him down several flights of steps, find his body, put his body into the trunk of a car, and then throw him over a bridge. It's very apparent that this woman could not physically have committed this murder, that she's in jail for having committed. They get to the point where the case is either going to have to go to trial or there's going to be a negotiated resolution. I didn't have money for an attorney. You know, my family, they're comfortable, but just your average person doesn't have millions of dollars to give to a lawyer. So I thought, well, I didn't do it, so it ought, ought to be pretty easy to prove. So they appointed me a public defender. My lawyer said they were going to try to get the death sentence. And then they'd come back a little bit later, and they said if I would admit to it, I could get life instead of death. I didn't want to plead guilty that day. Sitting in jail, waiting on a trial, she's told, our wheels of justice are really slow. It's at least two years for you to get a trial. And then, if a jury convicts you, you have at least 25 years. She trusted what people were telling her. She's scared. And she thinks the best thing for herself is to take a plea deal. But Susan is insistent that she's innocent. And so she wants to take what's called an Alfred plea. An Alfred plea allows a defendant to go in front of a judge and say, Judge, I didn't commit this crime. However, I recognize that the evidence against me, the prosecution has, is sufficient to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that I'm guilty. Susan would have been looking at about 25 years if she was convicted of murder. Uh -huh. Part of the Alfred deal was it would be down to a 10-year maximum sentence, but that she would be eligible for, for parole after six months. Oh, that's a no-brainer. Right. Susan wanted to do whatever it was going to take to get going with her life again.
At the time she entered that plea of guilty, she had served enough time in jail already to be eligible for parole. The parole board expected her to acknowledge she had committed this crime, and Susan King never, ever admitted she had done this crime. The irony of the whole situation is that the parole board said that she didn't show enough remorse. But she said she didn't do it. Right. And so they said, you don't seem remorseful for your crime, so now you have to serve out, which is 10 years. Susan says, wait a minute, this is not the deal that I signed up for. On the surface, the Alford plea makes sense because you are maintaining your innocence and it's your way out. In Susan's case, they hold that against her. So what's the right move? It's impossible to figure that out. It's hard to explain what happens to you in prison, what happens to your mind. It was the awfulest place that you could ever imagine. The meanest people you ever want to deal with. People I didn't even know could be that mean. Those are the ones that worked there. Girls ganged up on me and were kicking me in the ribs and stuff. Then all I could do was ball up in the corner of that cell. You just ball up in a ball and cry. So this is the vantage point with this bridge dump. Yeah, 10 years before, they demolished the old bridge. Did the other bridge also have a retaining wall like this one? Yeah. The state's whole theory of the case is that Susan was able to obtain a car, mm -hmm. drive up here, all on crutches, park the car on the bridge, and get a 200-pound body over this retaining wall. You think if the grand jury heard that she only had one leg and how much she weighed, they would have gone for it? Knowing her physical condition at the time of the murder, I didn't believe it. Yeah. I didn't weigh but about 100 pounds and I didn't have but one leg. And anybody with a right mind wouldn't think that I do all the things Harwood said I did. It's my understanding that a 98-pound person with one leg is capable of pulling a trigger on a firearm and capable of pulling it multiple times. What I think occurred after that, Susan employed some help to move that body from her residence. Could she have utilized the Gratz Bridge to roll the body off into the water? Absolutely. She could have also disposed of a body utilizing a boat both of those are theories. We can't prove either or. I was in law school in 2010, and I was doing an internship with the Innocence Project. And I was assigned Susan's case. How old were you? 22. She's my first client. She's my first case. And our job is to see if there's an actual potential that this woman could be innocent, if there's anything there then the Innocence Project will run with it. But if there isn't, then they've done their duty in terms of looking into the case. What was your first meeting with her like? I distinctly remember her saying to me, honey, I'm not a saint, but I'm not a murderer. I didn't do this. And it was eating her up that the real killer was out there somewhere. I spent hundreds of hours over the course of 18 months digging through all of the facts and all of the evidence what did you guys uncover? One of the most interesting things was listening to the grand jury tape and realizing that Detective Harwood glossed over the fact that the ballistics were definitively not a match. The Kentucky State Police lab reports indicated conclusively that the bullet fragments found in her floor with those bullet holes did not match the bullets that were found in his head. It was a 22 Magnum versus a 22 Long. Detective Harwood says they're all 22s, and then when asked about testing, he says, oh, it's inconclusive because they're degraded. When you fire a bullet, there's lands and grooves on a bullet that can connect that to the firearm that produced the bullet. But because a 22 caliber, it's a small and soft shell because of deformation, you can't do that. Harwood said they couldn't be compared. 
but they were compared and they were different. So that's a substantial mischaracterization. If the grand jury had been told the truth there and that those bullets did not match, it's very likely they wouldn't have returned an indictment and we wouldn't even be sitting here today. There was bullet holes in that house when I bought it, but I put a couple of them in there myself. I was at home one day and this motorcycle comes up my driveway. This guy's on it and he just walked right in my house, drunk as he could be. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'll come to see you. And then he got getting closer to me and started touching me and things. And I got scared. So I had a pistol, but I pulled it out and I told him, I said, you need to leave now. He said, oh no, baby. And so I, I put two holes in the floor and one in the ceiling and he left. Detective Harwood makes a big point of the fact there was male human DNA, but he took that portion of her floor eight years after Kyle Breeden was murdered. It could have been anybody's. Oh, all right. So his next point is that Susan played the guitar. His body was found with a guitar amplifier cord wrapped around his legs. And she plays electric guitar? Susan says that she played an acoustic guitar and only got an electric guitar after his death. His next point is that she was a fisherman. In a river community, is it rare for a woman to fish? No, I don't think it's rare for a woman to fish. Okay. You know, there's a lot of people in this world like to fish and like to play guitar. That don't mean they murdered somebody. It doesn't mean that you need to get accused of something they didn't do. We determined that there was not really a shred of evidence to make us think that Susan actually committed this murder. We couldn't find anybody that would serve as an accomplice. So what happens next? Unfortunately, from a legal perspective, to be able to overturn any sort of conviction, okay. we have to have new evidence. The fact that evidence didn't exist isn't enough to get somebody out of jail. We had the tall task of sitting down with her and telling her that we believe you're innocent. We believe you didn't commit this murder, but we don't have any new evidence that's needed to exonerate you. What'd she say? That was a really hard conversation. She cried. She cried a lot. It was hard. But she honestly, she thanked us. She said, you're one of the only people that believe me. You're one of the only people that knows I didn't commit this crime and that actually believes me and that's gonna have to be enough. Jeez. And at that point, I graduated and I began practicing law. And it was pretty disheartening, to be honest, to realize you're going into a profession that um, is supposed to be promoting justice. And my first case is an obvious injustice. Then about a year later, I get a call from the director of the Innocence Project, and I'm told, are you sitting down? We have new evidence in Susan's case. I'd never heard Susan King's name until May 3rd in 2012. My name is Baron Morgan, and I was a narcotics detective with Louisville Metro Police Department. I got a call that was a shooting at a location I was investigating. The suspect, his name was Richard Jarrell. He was in, in the drug business for a while. I just wanted to know why was he shooting at this particular house. Within that conversation, he stopped and said, look here, detective, my brother got arrested for 22 kilos of cocaine. He said, if you can help my brother out, I will tell you about the first murder I committed. He said this guy's name was Denny Breeden. It's 2012. Susan is five years into a sentence for manslaughter for the death of Danny Breeden. And all of a sudden, somebody else comes forward with a totally different story to tell. I mean, we appreciate you talking to us, so. The dude that I killed, his name is Dean. Did we call him Dean? I didn't know him real well. Yeah. I know he sold $20 for him. I interviewed a lot of people in my life. When uh, Rich Jarrell told me this story, 
He didn't skip a beat. I believed him. I tell him uh, I'm going to pick him up. And it was my birthday. Remember, I said it was my birthday. And I was like, oh, my dad's going to get my money, you know. Richard told Breeden that he was going to take him to his father's house to uh, get hot. But on the way there, they stopped at a check cashing place. Breeden got some money out, and then they drove to this house. So we get out of the car, and I start putting the jacket on. Where I got this 22. Well, he walks up to the fence, and I blow his brains out. How many times did you shoot? Just two. Yeah. And I wrestle this fat piece <laughs> into the trunk of his car. I get him tied up with these uh, guitar like uh, cords, like you plug for the amplifier. He drove Breeden to the grass bridge, took him out of the car, and the way he was describing it, you could tell that he was relive, reliving the case. And I popped the trunk, wrestled this piece of down the trunk of the car. I put his fat ass up on the thing, yeah. and the bricks fell off. Yeah. I let him go anyways. All down into the water, and it was gone. Every little piece that I couldn't figure out fit perfectly in this confession tape. The day that he was last seen, Deanie went that morning and cashed a $250 check and that there was somebody in the car, but nobody knew who that was. Well, Richard Jarrell talks about going and getting the check cashed earlier that day. Nuh-uh. Oh, yes, he was the unknown person in he the car. He was the guy in the car! Try to remember the, the bank he went to. What about it? And what city do you think it was in? It was in Shelbyville. It was in Shelbyville. Yeah. The most compelling thing of all, Richard Jarrell says, I actually killed him as a birthday gift to myself. Look, it's my birthday. I'm going to kill this motherfucker. <laughs> For the 20 bucks, I mean, because he ripped you off. Right, and it was my birthday. So when I look it up, this man's 21st birthday was the day that he was last seen. And that's far too much of a coincidence to be able to just make up. 14 years later, that's nuts. The scary thing about it though, watching him tell that story, he went deep and he was enjoying it. And he told me at the end, I think I'm done, done talking to him, he was like, I felt so good. I knew that we got a bad guy we need to put away. We got an uh, innocent person in prison we need to get out. Baron Morgan did four things. Number one, you keep your chain of command informed. You notify the Commonwealth's attorney. You notify the prosecutor. And you notify the Kentucky State Police. I made a call to the state police. And for some reason, we couldn't get them to come out that night. I spoke with the Commonwealth Attorney Office in Jefferson County, and we agreed to contact the uh, Innocent Project. I was sitting in prison one day, scrubbing the toilet, and they called my name over the speaker. I'm like, now what? Now what am I in trouble for? Of course, they strip searched me, and then they put me in the visiting room, and in came uh, three, looked like angels, and said they were with the Innocence Project, and that they had some news for me. And I said, well, I could use some good news. And they said, Susan, a man has confessed to killing Beanie. He knew things nobody else would have known. Boy, my head went down on that table and I cried and cried and cried and cried. I said, maybe everybody will believe me now. We took the confession tape and were able to piece it together with all of the evidence that we had. At that point, we couldn't work fast enough. It was working day and night to put together a motion to get it before the court to say, here's the new evidence that we need. There's an innocent woman sitting in our jail system. How do we get her out? I remember getting a phone call late at night from a Louisville investigator saying that they had an individual that they arrested on an attempted murder charge that was wanting to confess to the Deany Breeden investigation. Gerald was an enigma. He was never mentioned in the case report. There was just nothing in any way, shape, or form to connect him with Kyle Denny Breeden with the exception of Gerald's statement. 
Detective Harwood, he comes up to Louisville and he interviews Richard Jarrell. I asked Gerald point blank, are you full of I wanted to know. And he even said it, I'm full of and admitted to me that he was being deceptive because he wanted to help out his brother. Detective Harwood goes and does an interview with Mr. Gerald, and at that point, Mr. Gerald withdraws his confession. The problem for us is that nobody really knows what was said in that interview, except for the fact that immediately after, Richard Gerald recants his entire confession. Detective Harwood says he recorded the conversation, but that tape was immediately stolen out of KSP's locked evidence file. I had five digital recorders. I cannot account for the recorder itself. It was lost in the process. Um, it has still not been found today, and it was obviously a huge mistake in the investigation. The confession has been recanted. What does that do to Susan's chances of getting out? It becomes a credibility issue. Was he telling the truth then, when he confessed to the crime, or is he telling the truth now, when he says, I didn't do it? So the prosecutor says to us, I'm going to let the judge decide. At this point, we have a long hearing, mm -hmm. and we present all the evidence to the judge. Mr. Jarrell comes, and he pleads the fifth. So we play the confession tape. Well, he walks up to the fence, and I blow his brains out. And then ultimately, the judge rules. There's overwhelming evidence of innocence, but he procedurally thinks that because she took a plea, rather than have let it gone on to a jury trial, he can't do anything legally. But her plea was to maintain her innocence. Right. Had this new piece of evidence existed, would she still have taken that plea? Because it's a technicality again. It is. It's a technicality. One of the procedural problems with this was that the motion they filed under the rule they used required there to be a trial. Well, there was no trial. So the judge concluded, since there wasn't a trial, I'm not going to allow you to withdraw your plea. And Susan had to remain in prison. When I got back from court that day, the officers had already packed up all my stuff. They thought I was going home. They couldn't believe that I had to stay in there after that confession. But I did. Susan had already served out her time. And so at this point, it's clearing her name. Eventually, the Court of Appeals agreed with us. This procedurally can't stand. This shouldn't be the law of Kentucky. It was a manifest miscarriage of justice to allow this innocent woman to sit in jail. And so Susan's Alfred plea is removed from the record, and she's deemed innocent. This is not an exoneration. This is an individual that has been given a new trial. However, you have to look at the case. And if we take this before a jury, one of them is gonna believe Richard Gerald or put enough credence to found her not guilty. Susan King was the victim of a flawed prosecution, a prosecution that Todd Harwood was responsible for. I think there might have been an attitude that the ends justify the means. He wanted to solve this case and put this murder on somebody, and the person he selected as the target was Susan King. So Susan came to me to represent her in the civil action against the Kentucky State Police and Harwood. Who is the civil suit against? Todd Harwood himself. And what was the basis of your claim? Malicious prosecution. That means he put me through hell that he shouldn't have. Lost all my animals, and I lost my cosmetology degree. No, you lost your house, you lost your career, your friends, and time with my family. And mentally, it just tears you to pieces going through something like this. I'll never get over it. I 
And I'm so thankful that I got enough money in my settlement to buy a home. But see, I had a home and it was paid for. And that's why one reason I settled out of court. I didn't have to have millions to make me happy, but I did need enough money to get me back what I had. I'm hoping it'll have some impact on how they handle wrongful convictions from now on. When I heard that Susan King was vindicated and she was no longer a convicted murderer, made my day. But the police department, they didn't want to admit that they made a mistake. After I gave them the audio tape of the confession, state police weren't that happy with me. Matter of fact, my chief of police and a couple more majors, they were pretty upset with me. I guess I crossed that blue line. When he disclosed this stuff, it reflected adversely upon KSP. So he was subjected to retaliation. He was assigned to basically an entry level patrolman's job. That was his reward for bringing forth the truth on what had happened to Susan King. So then at that point, we filed a whistleblower complaint against the Louisville Metro Police Department. There is so much loss in this story. There is Susan King, who lost her whole livelihood, her house. And there's Baron Morgan, whose career was derailed and whose stellar reputation was tarnished. But the thing that gets lost is that Deanie lost his life. He's the victim. And no one has ever been convicted of his murder. To hear Jarrell like, laugh and casually talk about throwing a man's body, a man who he murdered for fun, according to him, in this spot, this like beautiful spot, it just, it's unhinged. There's no justice. 